Welcome, dear brothers and sisters, to Who's Who in the Bible, Praying with Biblical Characters. This evening, we continue our reflection on John, the son of Zebedee. Was he also the evangelist? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we are so grateful for giving us John as the beloved disciple. We are thankful for the fourth gospel that guides us in our prayer, in our reflections, to come close to you. Help us during this episode to discover who exactly had something to do with the writing of the fourth gospel, which touches our hearts every time we read it. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Let's look at the outline for our study, dear friends. First, conflicting testimony of the early church fathers. The two endings to the Gospel of John. The purpose of John chapters 1 to 20, that is the first 20 chapters. Believing leads to life. Beloved disciple and Peter in the first 20 chapters. Beloved disciple and Thomas. Beloved disciple as the ultimate model of seeing and believing. We next come to the purpose of the final chapter in John chapter 21. The role of Peter and the beloved disciple in John 21. What exactly has the redactor told us in John 21? Let's come to the conflicting testimony of the early church fathers. Irenaeus and perhaps earlier, Polycarp and Clement seem to imply that John, the son of Zebedee, wrote the fourth gospel. But another witness, Eusebius, who documents a still earlier witness, Papias, who indicates two Johns in his testimony. The first John is from among the twelve. The second John is noted as John the elder. Eusebius himself sees John, the son of Zebedee, as the evangelist. But he believes that we cannot just dismiss the second John of Papias, the so-called presbyter or John the elder, who was considered to be the disciple of John, the son of Zebedee. That means the second John is the disciple of the first John, the son of Zebedee. Taking into account the reality of these two persons, both called Johns, scholars ask, is it possible that the early church fathers could have confused the Johns? And for this reason, not everyone today among the scholars believes with certainty that John, the son of, son of Zebedee, actually wrote the fourth gospel. We have in the gospel of John two endings. Many scholars believe the fourth gospel has undergone more than one recension or edition. That means more than one person has worked at it. There was no doubt a final redactor who gave us the Gospel of John as we read it today, we can discern the two endings in the fourth Gospel. In fact, any lay person can discern this if he or she only cares to look. Let us observe the first ending, chapter 20, verses 20, 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Then you have the final chapter, John chapter 21. There you have a second ending, the very last sentence of that chapter, 21, 25. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, 
I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Scholars believe, dear friends, that John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, that is the first ending, was actually the original ending to the fourth gospel. Chapter 21, the second ending, is in the context of the last chapter that was added later for a particular purpose. If we can find that purpose, the purpose of John 21, we may be better able to see the relationship between the beloved disciple and the evangelist. The purpose of the first 20 chapters of John. The purpose is stated actually quite clearly at the end of chapter 20. The verses that we read, but just as well we might read them again, these were written, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what's the purpose of the first 20 chapters of John? There is the call to believe in Jesus so that by believing you will find life. As one exegete, Rudolf Schnackenberg observed, Christology is oriented to soteriology. That means Jesus Christ has come to give abundant life. It means knowing, accepting, and believing in Jesus will lead to salvation, eternal life. Do you know, dear friends, the evangelist motivates the reader towards this conclusion from the beginning of the gospel. In the very prologue, chapter 1, verse 12, you read, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. The word believe is found almost 98 times in the Johannine Carpus, practically in every chapter of the Gospel of John. And believing is linked to finding life. The word believe linked to a significant outcome, namely life. That we may find eternal life is why the evangelist wrote the gospel. Let me read for you chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. From here, dear friends, I want to take you through a number of scripture texts right through the fourth gospel, which all link the verb believe with the actual outcome, finding life. Chapter 4, 42. They said to the woman, the Samaritan woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Believe leads to the Savior, finding life. 524. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Again, belief ends with eternal life. 635. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Believing will leave you satisfied. It will quench your thirst. 640. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Belief, once again, leads to eternal life. 647. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Again, belief leads to eternal life. Now we come to chapter 8, verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That means if you do not believe in the one whom God has sent, you will die in your sins. That means absence of life. 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes, one who believes shall have life. He or she will not die. 1140, Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Believe you shall see the glory of God, that is, eternal life. 1246, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. One who believes does not remain in darkness. He sees the light of day, the light of the life to come. 14, 1 and 2. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? In my Father's house are many rooms. The final resting place for each one of us when we meet God face to face. And finally, chapter 20, verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, he saw and believed. The beloved disciple saw and believed, a calling to each one of us to believe. The beloved disciple saw, what did he see? He saw the tomb empty, but he believed. What did he believe? The beloved disciple's belief will reach a climactic moment later with the first ending of the fourth gospel. Once again, we come to the first ending of the fourth gospel, 2031. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Even as we look, dear friends, to the purpose of the fourth gospel, let us examine another aspect played out in the first 20 chapters of John. And that is the relationship between the beloved disciple and Peter. Peter, beloved disciple, and Peter in John 1 to 20. How does Peter appear in John 1 to 20? It appears that the evangelist the first evangelist downplays the significance of Peter whenever he is in the company of the beloved disciple. Let's examine the texts where both are present. The very first time, John chapter 13, verses 23 and 25, the Last Supper, Jesus says, One of you will betray me. And Peter beckons the beloved disciple to ask, who is that? He does not dare ask it of Jesus himself. The next, at the foot of the cross, John 19, verse 26, we have Peter who is absent. But the evangelist tells us that the beloved disciple is given as son to Mary, symbolically called woman, behold your woman, behold your son. Thereafter, Jesus entrusts his mother to the beloved disciple. There is an interplay between the church represented by the woman, that is Mary, and every individual represented symbolically by the beloved disciple. This interplay has the beloved disciple in it. One would have expected Peter to play that part. 
Why? Because in the Synoptic Gospels, on Mark and Matthew, it is Peter who is given the keys of the kingdom. But in the fourth gospel, it is the beloved disciple who has braved the odds and is present at the foot of the cross. And Peter is absent. Third, in John chapters 20, 1 to 10, the post-resurrection narrative, we have Peter and the beloved disciple together. On learning from Mary Magdalene that the tomb is empty, Peter and the beloved disciple run towards the tomb. And yet it, yet, it, yet it is only about the beloved disciple that the evangelist says he saw and believed. Nothing is said about what Peter felt. The very next text, after that, the beloved disciple and Thomas, just before the climactic conclusion to the first Part of the gospel, chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, the evangelist tells us of Thomas's confession of faith, my Lord and my God, chapter 20, verse 28. Earlier, John the Baptist has recognized Jesus as son of God in chapter 1, verse 34. So has Nathaniel, chapter 1, verse 49. Later, Martha in chapter 11, verse 27. And in the post-resurrection narrative, Mary Magdalene weeps, they have taken my Lord away. Even the disciples in the absence of Thomas in the upper room were glad when they saw the Lord. But it is not a confession, mind you. It's only when Thomas enters the picture that you have the a personal confession of faith my Lord and my God. Thomas addresses Jesus the way Jews addressed Yahweh. He honors Jesus as God, my Lord, my God. This confession of Thomas is in agreement with the general theology of the fourth gospel. For Jesus declares the will of the Father, chapter 5, verse 23 that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son, does not honor the Father who sent him. Yet, dear friends, it's good to note, not everything seems to be all right with Thomas. But just after his personal confession of faith, P, uh, Thomas is taken to task. In chapter 20, verse 29, chapter, verse 28, he made his confession of faith. Verse 29, this is what Jesus said to him. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So we may laud, we may praise the confession of Thomas, but it has come only after a personal seeing of Jesus and not because of the testimony of others. When that testimony was given by the rest, we have seen the Lord. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So beloved disciple is the ultimate model of seeing and believing. Thomas is taken to task for wanting to see Jesus face to face in order to believe. But we are told that the beloved disciple saw and believed. He saw in the absence of the testimony. Testimony came only later. He saw the empty tomb and he believed. And in that context, Peter is taken to task. Peter saw the same evidence but we are not told that he believed. Now, Thomas is taken to task because he has heard the testimony, but he has not believed. Whereas the beloved disciple, in the absence of any evidence, had believed. And so what has the evangelist of the first 20 chapters really done? The evangelist has tried to propel the beloved disciple as an example as an example par excellence of what believing 
actually means. On the basis of the climactic conclusion to the first ending of John in chapter 20, verse 30, 31, we may infer that the beloved disciple believed that Jesus is the expected Messiah. He believed Jesus as Son of God and who would lead those who believed in him to eternal life. Now we come to the purpose of chapter 21. We must now consider John chapter 21, the final chapter, the last addition to the gospel. Most likely by a redactor of the entire gospel to give us the gospel we read today. What exactly did the redactor do by adding chapter 21? Was it just an addition? Or was it an addition with her purpose? The final redactor, I believe, wanted to give a final perspective to the gospel. And for this, we need to examine the role of Peter and the beloved, beloved disciple once again in the final chapter. Chapter 21 has two sections, verses 1 to 14 and verses 15 to 25. In the first section, 21 verses 1 to 14, Jesus appears to the seven disciples. Peter has taken the initiative to go fishing, and they have caught no fish. And then you have the voice of Jesus coming from the shore. My children, have you caught anything? And then the answer is negative, and Jesus says, to put, cast the net on the right side. As per Jesus' directions, there is a huge catch of fish. And when that happens, it is the beloved disciple who turns to Peter and says, it is the Lord. In the next section, verses 15 to 23, we have Jesus asking Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What does more than these mean? What does these refer to? The noted Catholic scripture scholar Raymond Brown gives us three answers. First, these could refer to these things. Peter, do you love me more than these things? Pointing to his fishing equipment. Have you said a final goodbye to your fishing in order to follow me? Or these can refer to, Peter, do you love me more than you love these, your fellow disciples? Or these can refer to one more thing. Peter, do you love me more than these, your fellow disciples love me? What is the obvious answer? I think the third answer, do you love me more than your fellow disciples love me? And if that is true, dear friends, the, the redactor of chapter 21 is trying to propel Peter as the chosen one to take the prime position among those he has called. But we must ask why this has happened. We go back to chapter 13 of John, verse 37, where Peter had made the boast, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. If that boast had been empty then, what about now? Are you willing to follow me now, Peter? Jesus is giving Peter an opportunity to redeem himself. How will Peter follow? We hear that in chapter 21, verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. 
But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. What has Jesus said? Jesus was indicating how Peter was to follow Jesus through martyrdom. And that becomes clear in the following verse, 21 verse 19. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Dear friends, there is now a juxtaposition, side-by-side placement of Peter and the beloved disciple in this episode. When Peter asks our Lord, Lord, yes, I am to go to my martyrdom. He doesn't say that in words, but he knows it. And he points to the beloved disciple and he says, Lord, but what about this man? Peter wants to know the beloved disciple's future. If I'm called to martyrdom, what about him? And how does Jesus answer Peter? Verse 22, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So what is Jesus saying? What does he mean? He's telling Peter, you follow me. Yes, you're marked for martyrdom. But is he telling Peter that the beloved disciple is not going to die until he comes again? That means there would be no martyrdom for the beloved disciple, but there is martyrdom for you. And that is how many understood Jesus saying concerning the beloved disciple. But is that what Jesus really meant? When he said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, until I come. In verse 23, we have the evangelist, the redactor, giving us the explanation. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die yet. Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? The explanation provided by the redactor here, dear friends, is meant to tell us that the beloved disciple had been dead by the time this last chapter was being written. If so, How will the beloved disciple remain until Jesus comes if he is already dead? The answer is, he remains alive, true to Jesus' word, through the testimony he gives to Jesus, through the gospel he has caused to write. The evangelist clearly, therefore, has proposed to us Two ways of following Jesus. One demanded of Peter through martyrdom. The other is the way of the beloved disciple through bearing testimony to Jesus through the written gospel. Witness through death or testimony in life. So dear friends, what exactly has the redactor told us in John Chapter 21. First, let us surmise why John 21 was added later to the gospel. In the light of our grasp of this chapter until now, and in view of how the chapter ends, it is verse 24 that gives us the answer. 21 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Here, the redactor is telling us about the beloved disciple. This is the beloved disciple who is bearing witness, who has borne testimony to what you read. 
But there is something more that the redactor is telling us. That the beloved disciple has borne witness, having written these things for us. But notice the aorist participle written grapsas in Greek can have a causative meaning. That means that the beloved disciple himself did not write this testimony, but he caused it to be written at the hands of others, those in the community. First the evangelist of the first 20 chapters, and later the final redactor who gave us chapter 21. Further, the evangelist writes, we know that his testimony is true. Who is this we? The we here is the evangelist who speaks on behalf of the community of the beloved disciple. But why did the evangelist write, assist the beloved disciple in this project? The redactor informs us unambiguously because we know that his testimony is true. Both the evangelist and the redactor believed that the testimony of the beloved disciple, John, the son of Zebedee, was genuine. As Hermann Ridabas, the Dutch exegete, informs us, the final redactor has given us reason for the addition of chapter 21. That is, to show, reveal the permanent role of both the beloved disciple and the beloved disciple's gospel. Now we come to our final conclusion. What the redactor of John 21 has done, dear friends, is simply marvelous. If the evangelist of John 1 to 20, the first 20 chapters, has propelled the beloved disciple as an example par excellence of what believing in Jesus actually means, the redactor of John 21 has rescued Peter as the foremost representative of mission. Do you love me more than these other disciples do? This question was addressed to Peter. The mission of Peter is recognized because by the time of the completion of the fourth gospel, many Christians had followed Peter's way of witnessing to Jesus through martyrdom. At least 10 of Jesus' original 12 had been martyred. At the same time, the beloved disciples counsel that the Christians ought to bear testimony to Jesus is how most of us are called to live our lives. The redactor of John chapter 21 is neither trying to drive a wedge between Peter and the beloved disciple, nor promoting one mission as better than the other. Peter and the beloved disciple offer us two distinct ways of giving witness to Jesus. However, both offered witness to the original addressees of the gospel, the Jews, and probably also the proselytes in the diaspora. In their witness, they pointed to Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. In the perspective of the fourth gospel, it is by believing in Jesus, they will have life in his name. That was why the fourth gospel was written, to offer Jesus as the way, the truth, and life. Let's pray, dear friends, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, that we be willing and strengthened to give whatever manner of witness God asks of us. Lord, help us to point to Jesus and not to ourselves. And in so doing, may we to show people the path to eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Thank you, dear friends, for your attendance this evening. We hope to see you in our future episodes. Reflect on them. This will bring you closer to God, to others, and to your own selves. Thank you.